Hey YouTube, it's your boy, uh, Gabe, coming at you with some, uh, more premium tier lists, because the only thing I love more than premium is our subscribers and this goddamn game. Let's get started. So, uh, fortunately, somebody on Twitter, his username is TerryTheCat3, charted out the past seven BCS events of the most recent season for the ban list for premium events, and it gives you a percentage of all of the top eight slots and how often the deck made it there. So this doesn't include what won or what the top three were. If I can find that, I'll try to include that as soon as I can and get that and include it in the description in the comments. But for now, we'll just take a look at these top eights. For the most part, the format is pretty diverse. The top two decks were Katrina and Ezel, and I think most of us after the ban list were expecting that. Uh, Ezel and Katrina were two of the highest topping decks of the previous format before the ban list, and Katrina didn't get hit at all, and Ezel was barely touched. It really wasn't even touched to begin with. It really makes sense that these two decks not only maintained where they were, but also shot up in popularity just because the other decks that were in the same percentage range were completely cut out. So these are the highest quality decks of there. Now, it, where it gets interesting is the following decks, because after this is where it gets to be pretty diverse. So after Ezel is Luard. So Luard was also doing pretty well before the ban list, and it wasn't touched on the ban list at all. Frankly, I'm kind of surprised that it only has the 11% that it does. I kind of expected it to have higher percentages because it wasn't touched. I think part of why it only has the representation it does is the deck itself, I think, is a bit expensive in terms of, like, physical price that you need to pay for it. Arguably less helmet than a lot of the other decks on this list. But you, you need to be able to get to first or more Fessa, and if you don't get that, your deck kind of starts to hurt and you're not doing a whole lot on your first stride turn. As well, the grade 2 game, while it's decent, it's pretty much just going to be getting grade 1s with Nemen and getting some hand power with Maga. It's grade 2 game is fine, but it's not that amazing. Next on the list is Castile, which um, I'm... Not really that surprised that it got here. It wasn't doing amazing before the ban list, but after the ban list hit dropped, I'm not surprised that it got as far as it did, just because NLK, with even with one Enigmatic Assassin, is still a very strong combo, and with Castile being able to get that first stride NLK with Castile and getting people from zero to six is honestly not that hard for the deck to do. So I'm not surprised that it's getting, that uh, it's where it is, especially because a lot of the highest decks were addressed. It's still a very powerful deck. It's pretty combo heavy and you need to know how to be able to not only get the uh, 13 soul on first stride, but also have the right setup just to make sure that if you're not winning that turn, that you're going to win the turn um, after that. After that is GN and Overlord, both tied at 7%. Uh, GN, honestly, kind of surprised it made it this far. I think part of why it does is because it being an Excel clan mixed with cards like um, Baller Earl was really good for the deck just because not only is your front row getting pretty big power, you're having a large front row and multi-attacking thanks to new big belt, new relatively speaking big belly and a uh, crown tiger. But also um, the new mana garm is a strong card being able to get either 10 K to up to four units or up to septuple drive or some distribution of the two can make for a pretty threatening board. And it's great nature. It's kind of the whole thing is that it's able to get a good hand after applying a lot of pressure during its battle. On Overlord, now that we have um, the Heroic Evolution, you can Legion 
with um, the Cross and V series, the end, to get three Legion attacks. And if you're able to get a Force Gift before you do that, that the Legion attack is going to be 44k each time, and you have access to all of the cards to make it even more threatening. Like that one card that turns um the one card that turns your the end into battle door so that the guard two cards each time you have a lot of retire power part of why i think it's doing so well is it's a good matchup to katrina because you can just use cards like defeat flare or um denial griffin on their big numbers or their back row just so you don't have to drop as much and you can also retire some of their cards so unless they have a bunch in G-Zone to get the full board from Katrina, or they will have to commit hand to their board. So, yeah, Overlord, it can be... It's basically kind of just new thing saver in how it's a like very multiple high-powered Vanguard attacks from the Legion. So I think that's definitely helpful. Kind of surprised that Blade Master isn't showing up, but, you know, the Overlord generic support's always good. There's that one grade two that, like, lets you stride. It's just a suck at stride fodder. It's So, yeah. Next is going to be Grand Blue and Nubatama tied at 3%. Grand Blue is kind of doing what it's always been doing. The whole play is to get um, all of your Skull Dragons and Drop Zone and then going into Megiddo while you also have access to... Um, that one grade three that lets you call from drop zone when it's hollowed. So you get like six attacks that are massive numbers that you're really only surviving if you have like four PGs in your hand. Um, it's a, well, it's not super consistent. It's a very powerful turn. And the deck itself is also good at deck fitting just because you have Obadiah, which lets you send all you let you send up to five of any card from deck to drop zone so that's just ripping five non-triggers out of your deck so it's pretty consistent it's just a bit slow which is why i think it's not super high on the list next is nubatama so i'm not surprised it's on the list honestly it's the choice restriction of switching between jamyo congo and uh, Shira Nui Rene definitely hurt the deck because that combo was what was keeping it there. But both of the cards in and of themselves are definitely powerful. And the fact that Jami Congo can reduce your opponent's hand to six or to four if you have the three in soul in a premium meta, as I said in the banlist discussion, because you're able to reduce their hand size before you attack, no matter even if you don't have access to Rene, it's still really hurtful and premium. You do that while they're at like four or five, and then you go into a toggle lord to put their hand down to like three. Or you can, if you want, you can go into the original GR that makes their hand four. It can be really threatening to any deck that isn't able to kill quickly. So I'm definitely not surprised there. Another thing that's not surprising is Melody making it on the list. Uh, because, yeah, it lost uh, the G-Guard and um, Ange was put to one. But the choice restriction and standard of having to pick between Sonata and um, whatever the grade two is that lets you call from top deck, that choice restriction didn't make itself into premium. And because of that, the deck got a very strong early game. And as well, it also got a very strong grade three ride turn because you can just do what the deck did in standard while your opponent's playing the grade two game. So you, ha you still have standards grade two game that you play with your opponent. And then when you think you can kill them, you'll just do what Sonata was already doing before. So it's not surprising that that made it there. Chaos is also pretty unsurprising just because it's a good counter to Neo Nectar. If your opponent doesn't kill you with the deck and they don't clear if, it, if you don't kill chaos with neo nectar they will just lock your board um and if you are able to get the triangle lock what's the deck going to do you'll go into something like um the verano 
and no in what the uh Valhamina, I'm sorry. And like have her GB four and have it be like a twenty thirty three two crit attack, and that's the end of your turn because the deck doesn't have an answer to triangle lock because most people are either running Cecilia for their uh, post grade th uh, two game turn to try to kill on that turn, or they're running Exploding Tomato just to um, make their Katrina turn stronger. Nobody's running cards like Asha. Which, even then, if they did, it only answers one of the lock cards, so it still definitely hurts the Neo Nectar matchup. Next is the leaders. Uh, doesn't surprise me that it made it there, because you have the new lie down the leader given, which isn't a hard once per turn, and it's able to restand your G units like two or three, uh, two times. So it kind of functions in the same way as Overlord, just a bit less consistent. And also costs a bit more because you need to put six cards from hand and field in the drop zone. But being able to do restand a G unit against a deleted card while also getting triple, then twin, then single drive, with also having stand triggers to abuse a deleted unit makes for a very, very powerful and very, very scary turn. So it is uh, very threatening, it's just a bit high risk, high reward, and a bit less consistent than Overlord, which is why it only has a third of the representation that Overlord does. Next is Blasters. Blaster is a very consistent deck. Because of all of the Blaster support from Logic of Salvation and Light of Destruction, or whatever the hell the name of the Brant set was, you basically just got a bunch of new Blaster cards, so Wing All Brave can search your entire deck, and if you go first, you can ride into Mesionic, and because you have the consistency and prior Blaster cards, you have more than just five Blaster units, so you ride Grade 3 against your opponent who's at Grade 2, it's pretty easy to get the full field of Blasters and just one-hit kill your opponent. Uh, again, I think part of why it's only at 2 is... Just, you know, because uh, consistency. You, it's kind of like Ezel where you gotta win the die roll. And if you don't win the die roll and you're playing against Protect or just a faster deck, you're screwed. Uh, next is the Pale Moon Loop, also at 2%. Uh, kind of not surprised that there's at least some representation just because it is... For all intents and purposes, one of, if not the first, infinite loops the game has really seen. Um, yeah, you had things like Refros, but Refros, at some point, Refros became kind of redundant because there was a point where your opponent would be unable to guard it, so they would just take it or PG it. But the Pale Moon loop is you are able to get so many attacks that unless your opponent damages like two, a trigger or two, and you can't hit them, you're going to beat them if you pull it off. It's just slow and fickle. It was doing decently before Premium Collection. After Premium Collection, when the game became much faster, it definitely petered out. And you also have cards like... Uh, you have it, it kind of gets hurt by Retire Clans, where if you hit a combo piece, the deck doesn't do anything. But if you're not playing against a com uh, Retire Heavy Clan, and you're playing against a slower clan, something like... Uh, Nubatama or Grand Blue, or heck, even Over uh, Overlord, provided they don't ha are aren't able to retire on your turn, you're able to pull out the combo semi consistently because the deck is pretty consistent. Thanks to Visible Songstress and uh, Rain Element Tear, it's too slow to put any higher, honestly. But because of that, I think it's a very, um, it's, it's definitely a deck that you should probably know what to, uh, to keep out for. Lastly, rounding up the list is Angel Gize. The Angel Gize specifically uh, deck got a huge boon from Premium Collection with New Raphael, because it just lets you heal two cards. So it just gives you basically, A, two more chances to hit triggers, but also two more chances to take damage. As well... A bunch of cards in Angels when um, the gift, when Imaginary Gifts were uh, first announced, they were put on a watch list because if you put gifts in the damage zone, you get to heal for free. And while that's not always the most viable strategy, because you yes, you lose a PG, like, yes, you're healing one, 
but sometimes the PG can be more helpful just because cards get extra crits or whatever. So sometimes you're not going to want to do that. But combining that with Raphael mean and hell, even Metatron, because there are ways of putting cards from your hand into it off of Vanguard skills. Because you have access to Metatron, New Raphael, and the gift um, ruling, you can theoretically heal three to four cards in a turn, which is great for stalling out for the Gize um, play. But I think part of why it isn't um, getting farther is aside from this, it doesn't have a whole lot of teeth. Uh, losing triggers on both offensively and damage really hurts the deck, but also it doesn't really have a grade two game. So any deck that's able to rush, which the top two decks are able to do easily because grade two gaming with Neos or skipping to three and striding with Azul really hurts the deck. But, and as well, Neos are able to hit Gize numbers, and that's not like always going to be what beats the Gize player, but it means that the 30k base, while it's obviously helpful, isn't going to be the how you get away from it. A lot of these decks do have answers to a 30k base now, especially thanks to the new increase in trigger power. That's it for what's topping. I'm going to now kind of just... Honestly, this chart is a pretty clear tier list in and of itself. The tier 1 is very clearly Katrina and Ezel. They both have more than double the representation of top 8 cut slots of the next preceding deck. And the fourth preceding deck, they have almost triple that's representation, and they have triple of what's tied for fifth place. So it's very, very clear how far ahead these are. And to everybody who was like, oh, can we ban Neon after it's broken law after the weekend at New Jersey, where top eight was um, six Neon Nectar, it's a very powerful deck, yes, but as you can see, it's arguably the strongest but it's not so far ahead of everything else that it needs to be hit at least this quickly out of the ban of the after the most recent ban list. We had a ban list and then the first event then it got 75% of top 8 which is just 6 out of 8. Everybody wanted it to be banned. If you go to my Twitter, uh follow me. It's a uh, at B Chung Abe B C H U N G A B E. You can see I was like after somebody made a post saying, hey, can we ban this? I just said, why? Because it's only one event. If it does this kind of... Uh, if it only, if it has this level of tier one presentation for like the next four or five months, yes. Then it needs to be addressed. But you can't really have a ban list to hit Katrina so far after the original ban list, especially considering how big it was, because it didn't give time for the deck, for A, the meta to settle, but B, for the deck, for a uh, power creep to happen, because we're getting, I don't think any sets were introduced by the time people were complaining about Katrina, or if anything, it was just one, and that would have been like Aerial Liberation, which didn't impact the premium meta at all. It didn't give any time for power creep. Part of why Anji needed to get hit was because it was doing well before the reboot, and even a year into the reboot, it was still doing well, and that's why it needed to get touched. Things like Nubatama were hit, and um, Ezel were hit, not because they were broken, but because they provided an unhealthy mechanic for the game. Ezel flat out ignoring um, the riding mechanic and just abusing the change in stride rule with Nubatama just ripping your opponent's hand out wasn't fun for game mechanics. Yes, Katrina is very, very powerful, but that's all it is. It's just powerful. It, I would argue that because it's only been a couple months and not the year, year and a half that Ange was good, it's not so powerful, it's unhealthy, especially because it only has 25%. Things like Yu-Gi-Oh! Sky Striker was barely touched, and it's been good for over a year. Um, decks have to have this 25% representation for a while, like, the Yu-Gi-Oh! ban lists only come every three months, and I think if Katrina was doing as well as it did, and it started doing better, and then three months later, then yes, we can talk about hitting Katrina, but I think it's still too soon to start talking about whether it needs to be hit. 
I think there's definitely going to be something in the upcoming future that will impact the meta that will bring Katrina down naturally because it's only unhealthy because of how powerful it is, not because of what it does mechanically. And I would also argue that Katrina isn't even the best deck in the format. I would argue that Ezel is better. I think part of why Katrina has the representation it does is just because the deck is so cheap. You can easily build the deck for like 60 to $70, and it's a tier 1 deck, because the main deck, the only VR you run is Cecilia, and you don't even need to run Cecilia. The G units you run besides um, uh, New Katrina are mostly irrelevant. Like, yeah, there are some pricier ones, like Zoa and Megaloma, I guess, but you don't really need them. Like, yes, they're helpful, but the deck is probably going to do what it's going to do without them. So it's so much cheaper than Ezel, which runs like the gambit of six to eight VRs because all the Ezels are VRs. And then you kind of need Ultima on the deck because Ultima is the best finisher. So the deck is, I think it's just because the deck is so much, the deck is stronger than Katrina, but it just costs so much more money why would you spend three times as much as you could when you could have a deck of a relative caliber and power? Uh, that's the tier one, though. Next tier two also should be pretty obvious. Luard, Gastille, GN, and Overlord. Um, they're fairly... They're, I explained why they're doing well. Uh, they're all pretty close to each other, only varying uh, 2 to 4%. And I think uh, 2 to 4% from the bottom to the top so I think this is a pretty good chunk. And then tier 3 would be everything on the list because it's 4% down from the second, from the bottom of tier 2, but they all only have a difference of 1% in the representation. So they're all fairly the same. Uh, I've been going on long enough, I think. Uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. Please let me know what you think. Please let me know if you have any other sources that you can show me, like other events, other pages that have these. You know how much I like to do these videos for you. You know how much I want to make tier lists as good as they can, just because of how controversial tier lists in Vanguard can be. I want to make the best videos I can, just informationally, because I think there's a lot of bad content out there for that, and bad perspectives on it. But thank you all so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe again. Uh, if you want to follow my Twitter to see all of my political takes, my memes, and my weeaboo nonsense, and me, my queer posts, again, it is a big chung, Abe, B-I-G-C-U-N-G-A-B-E. The profile picture is me on the best Spike Brother unit, Adelaide. That meme is old, but it's still the best card. Uh, thank you again, and see you in the next video.